Hello everybody, today is another video on supernatural parenting. So today I am going to cover emotional and spiritual healing. This will be just an overview. Um, we'll touch on a few different things that will give you some keys how to emotionally and uh, spiritually heal, which uh, the benefit of that is then if you have any physical issues, your physical body will actually heal. So again, Supernatural Parenting video two, I'll put into the description the first one, which is on physical healing. If you wanted a recap on the first video, the first video is just simply command uh, your body to be well. So I command in the name of Jesus for all pain to go. Um, it's just that simple. As a believer in Jesus, we command, we don't beg, we don't, you know, we don't plead. But when it comes to emotional and spiritual healing, there is a strong connection. So um, let's just jump in. So it's impossible to be a spiritual giant if you are not emotionally healthy. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have the biggest anointing in the room and see signs, wonders, and miracles and still be really messed up emotionally. It's entirely possible because it's God doing it. But in order to be emotionally and spiritually healthy, they are a one you know, there are one. So you, if you get emotionally healthy, then you become spiritual healthy. You know, they go together. Okay. And then the manifestation of that, your physical body actually starts to heal. So what are some things you can do to deal with your emotional and spiritual health? You can go to a counselor, you can go to a pastor, you can go do sozo, you can do a team ministry where a ministry has the, the gift of discernment and they can begin to pinpoint at four years old, this happened to you. At seven years old, this happened to you. And there's emotional and spiritual doors open. And then this is how to heal and fix those things. You can take classes. Um, all of these things are great as a believer in Jesus. And as a leader, you should be a lifelong learner. This should be a lifelong process for you that you are always getting healthier through Jesus Christ. Now, some tips. Whether you're a pastor, a mom, a dad, a minister, you know, a student, whoever you are, it's very important when you seek help to, to do some really important things. Because what often happens is when we're wounded or when we're finally reaching out to get help, we don't realize that we need to actually interview our counselor, interview our pastor, the Sozo team. For example, this could be the best Sozo team on earth that happens to be in your hometown but they may actually be the worst fit for you. Or this could be the best counselor, number one in their field, but it may not be a good fit for you. So you always need to interview these folks and ask them questions. One of the number one questions, whatever issue you're going to them for, you should always ask, hey, so tell me some testimonies of people that you've seen healed or delivered from these kind of issues. And if they can't tell you any, then you say, God bless you and you, and you kind of move on. But oftentimes when we're uh, in that place of vulnerability and trying to grow, sometimes we put ourselves in the hands of, of the wrong people. So seek prayer, seek the Holy Spirit in this process, but use wisdom, okay? And the biggest thing, I'll say this a few times, is to be emotionally healed, it actually takes faith. Faith is an action. Um, unless God miraculously heals you, which he can, and I'll share a testimony uh, later on in this video about how that can happen, but uh, it's, it's the rarity. It's more often that God heals through relationships. And here's why. When you are wounded by a relationship, God brings someone else in to heal you through relationship because it was the way you were harmed. And that's what's the most powerful is when you get healed, then you are able to heal other people through Jesus Christ. And we have to remember if, if a relationship hurt us, it's the relationship that's going to heal us. And if you think back to anything that's ever happened to you, it's always involves another person. That's, that's the difficult process of this. And there is the things where harm has been done to us. And then there's things where we've done harm to other people. And so the key is dealing with both of those things. Um, which is definitely not easy. Now, not everyone is going to go through this journey. Um, this is a journey I've gone through. Um, I've, I've been a life coach, a counselor, a pastor over the last 20 years. 
and I've worked with many people in individual groups and, and lots of different settings. So I've been blessed to um, just have the opportunity to engage with a lot of people with a lot of different issues. And so what I want to share with you, like I said, this is an overview, but I want to share some key things that when you're either working with your own children or when you're working with other people, these are questions that you can begin to ask the Holy Spirit. You can ask your friends. Um, let's, so let's just jump in. So let's say you have somebody that you're trying to help and they seem motivated uh, to, to take action. Uh, you have to be able to identify what is, is this an emotional or spiritual issue or is it both? And so here's a great example. If you have somebody who suffers from severe depression, nobody wants to hear, oh, you have a familiar spirit or what's called a demon um, or anxiety. And what happens is the medical field has lots of medication for these types of things. But many times these are actually spiritual issues that need to be removed from our life. And medication may temporarily work for these things, but in a sense, it just numbs us or dulls us from being able to be fully free. Okay. So let me give you an example. So a familiar spirit, according to the Bible, the, the Hebrew picture is like a leather water bottle that's attached to your side and it's familiar and it gets to the point where you don't even realize it's there. And what happens is in a sense, it sucks the life out of you. It drinks the water from the source. You are the source of God. You are like 70 to 90% water. And so have you ever heard somebody say, oh, I'm just so drained. And oftentimes people have an average of six to eight familiar spirits and it's just draining the life out of them. Now, this isn't a shame video. This isn't a condemnation video. So don't go, oh no, I knew there was something wrong with me. No, no, you're perfect in Jesus Christ. However, these tips and things will actually help you to get more set free. Now, let me give you some examples of um, what's called the familiar spirit. And most of you have had thoughts, you know, at some point in your life of things that you're like, well, that's not my thought. Where did that come from? Um, common, common thoughts are, I'm stupid. I'm not worthy. Sometimes people hear thoughts of killing themselves. Um, sometimes it's not even just a thought, but it's the dread where it's just like, I don't have any motivation to do any of these things. So oftentimes we can't tell the difference between a familiar spirit influencing us versus our own mind and our own thoughts. And if we're in an environment with someone else with these kind of spirits and we're a feeler or we're an intercessor, um, especially growing up in that kind of environment, a lot of times we'll actually take it on as if it's our own issue. And then what happens is we grow up, we, we step into you know, the freedom of you know, singleness or eventually getting married and starting our own family. And if we don't deal with it, um, we take what mom and dad had and then we just pass it on to our kids. So that's the thing. This is why it's so important to identify these things. So let me just quickly go through this list. This isn't every single familiar spirit, but these are some of the most common ones that you will encounter. Um, and if you feel like, oh, hey, that's that's me. That's something that you know the Holy Spirit is revealing to you. Just simply do this. As I'm reading through these, just simply go, I repent for partnering with and then whatever it is. Um, and then you can actually cut it off. You could put the blood of Jesus on it. And what's important is to then separate yourself from it and not partner with it anymore. And so I'll, I'll talk more about that as we go. So here's the list of some common familiar spirits that people deal with, okay? Abandonment, um, addiction, affliction, anger, anxiety, bestiality, bitterness, chaos, death, depression, discouragement, dread, envy, and fantasy. Fear, hatred, homosexuality, hopelessness, incest, infirmity, jealousy, lawlessness, lesbianism, lust, oppression, negativity, poverty, rape, rejection, religion, sickness, stress, torment, and being a victim. Now, let's give an example of, let's say you have fibromyalgia. It's very, very common. Um, and there's many things that are common like this and you get a diagnosis and then what happens is the diagnosis doesn't actually tell you what's operating in your life. But oftentimes, you know, with fibromyalgia, you're tired, you have no energy, you just, you feel horrible, right? And nothing seems to help you. There's not any medications or there's, or, you know, there's nothing. 
And then what's common for people with fibromyalgia is when they talk, they'll actually keep speaking it over themselves. Now, I don't think we need to get ridiculous and say, oh, never, I'm never going to speak that over myself. It's okay to say, hey, I've been diagnosed with this, but I don't receive it. But if you're one of those people who, whatever the affliction, whatever the diagnosis is, if you just keep saying it over yourself, what happens is you believe it because your brain believes what you tell it. That's the way God designed us. So if you keep saying, oh, I'm so sad, I'm so hurt, I'm so this, it's okay to like be honest and process those feelings. But the key is, is to separate yourself from those issues and get to the root. So example, fibromyalgia. Most people with fibromyalgia, they've experienced severe abuse, okay? Some kind of usually sexual or physical abuse, okay? And to your brain, physical and sexual abuse register as the same thing. And when you see a child who's been physically or sexually abused, it actually, their behavior looks the same. It's hard to tell which is which. That's why you have to use discernment. Um, most people with fibromyalgia, severe depression. Okay. So you see I'm, I'm two different um, familiar spirits. Most people with fibromyalgia suffer from some kind of tremendous fear. And it could be fear of the dark. It can be fear of being alone. It can be fear of not being successful. It can be many, many different things. And they sometimes suffer from anxiety, but you get the point. So if you just start praying, and I've prayed for people, I've seen God deliver them from fibromyalgia with instantly, instantly. And then what happens is they're like, they're so overwhelmed because it's the first time in maybe 20 years where they're like, I don't have this anymore. Like it's, it's gone. And then what happens is sometimes they actually leave the situation. They go back to all the same patterns. And then they, they start telling people, oh, I got healed of my fibromyalgia. And they'll actually get around someone to go, oh, that's not true. And they're so like, oh, that they actually take it on and then they start going back down that path. So it's important once you receive some kind of deliverance, it's also to be emotionally healthy, to be like, you know what? I'm the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm holy, I'm pure, I'm blameless, and I am set free this does not have anything to do with me. And if you ever feel like stuff starts coming back, you just say, no, I do not receive this. Instead of depression, I receive joy. Instead of anxiety, I receive peace. And sometimes you just need to take a breath. And sometimes it is a bit of a fight because oftentimes what happens is people get delivered and then they go back into, you know, as Jesus said to one, one person, you know, go and sin no more. And to another person, he says something different. Not every situation is black and white and the same, but hopefully this gives you an example of familiar spirits, how they can manifest in your life. And you could be the nicest man or woman on earth and have one of these things like speaking to you, giving you thoughts. And that's where those things come from. They're not generated from you. Okay. So that is the biggest key so far in this video on emotional and spiritual health, okay? So let's go on. So we often can't tell what our belief systems are because what you have to do is you have to look at what does your child do? What is the behavior you do? Behavior is an indicator of something that's going on, okay? Oftentimes we'll say, I believe in this or I believe in this. But what you say, while it's important, it's more important what you do. If you say going to church is important, but you don't go to church, well, obviously you don't believe going to church is important because you're not doing it, right? But then sometimes what happens is then we beat ourselves up for not going to church. Do you see how it just, like, it just messes with our mind instead of just going, you know what? I'm not going to church right now. Um, I'm completely at peace and I'm okay with that. Um, instead of like, in a sense, using our own thoughts or using a familiar spirit's thoughts against us to beat us up. And then that's when we feel stuck. So it's important for you to be able to identify what are you feeling in every situation? Because if you can't and you, you get attacked spiritually or you get attacked from someone else emotionally, it's really difficult to be able to identify what, you know, what, what is going on. Okay. And relationship is key for all of this. Okay. Relationship with Jesus, relationship with the Father, relationship with the Holy Spirit, because getting healthy takes faith, okay? Just bottom line, it's always in action. When I would do full-time life coaching and counseling, um, the first thing I would say to them after we went through paperwork 
and set up like this is what's going to happen, I would explain to them, while I'm happy to take your money, if we're still talking about the same issue eight months from now and you have not taken any action, then I'm sorry, I can't keep working with you because I, I feel responsible that I am here to help you move forward. That's my job. Um, and that's why, you know, sometimes I wasn't the best fit for somebody and sometimes they just weren't ready. They thought they were ready. And so this would happen is I would get six months in with somebody and I'd say, hey, we've talked about the same thing over and over and over again. And this is where if you're a pastor, if you're a SOZO leader, if you're a counselor and you continuously have the same conversation with somebody you're trying to help and you're not helping them, then I'm sorry, but you're the problem. You have to you have to gently encourage them and refer them to somebody else because what happens is people have this conversation. This is what happened, and then they go in a circle, and then nothing happens. They just go. It's like dancing around the mountain, and they feel temporarily better. And I know most of you have experienced this. You share whatever it is that you are embarrassed or ashamed or whatever at some point in your life, and you share it instantly. You're like, oh, I feel great, right? But if you had just gone to a counselor and all you did is share what is going on and you don't deal with any of it, you get in the car as you're driving home, you know, you may, it may be a familiar place and you just kind of tune out and you're just driving. And then all of a sudden, before you even get home, the depression comes back, the anxiety comes back, all that stuff starts flooding you because all you did is talk and talking is just one step. There are many, many more steps. So it's important if you're helping other people that you understand like, you have to have boundaries. You have to, um, if you're not helping someone, you have to move them along to someone else. And I can tell you every time I had that conversation with someone and said, hey, I love you. It's been six months. Um, I know you pay me every session, uh, but it's, but we're not making any progress. And I said, I can't continue to meet with you in good conscience. So here is a list of people. I, and some people would be very upset or they would feel rejected. Um, but what happened every single time is about six months to eight months later, they would call me up on the phone and they would want to meet again because they would go see another counselor or they'd go see. And that was the moment that they were ready because they had gone and visited with somebody else and realized that they were now ready to deal with this stuff. And then they would be full bore dealing with all of their emotional issues because at this point, and this is another key, if you're taking notes is relationship is so important and it's learning to trust again learning to trust again is what is going to heal you okay if you don't trust a, a person i mean and this is just a really common thing if say you're a woman and you had a horrible relationship with your dad or you never had a dad it can be very difficult to think of a loving father or think of god as a loving father like it can be very very hard that's why it's so essential that we receive the healing we need so that we can move on, right? Because healing is basically learning to trust again. Emotionally, you know, trust is one of the biggest things. Here's another tip for you. Most people have either both or one of these examples. They have the fear of being abandoned. Um, this is common with people who've been adopted. Um, these are com common for people, you know, kids who have divor been divorced or those kind of things, or just the feeling of rejected. Most people have that feeling of, of being rejected and so sometimes they'll reject you before they think you're going to reject them and that's why it gets to the point when you start to discern and see these patterns because discernment is is the discernment of spirits but it's also wisdom knowledge and understanding and seeing these patterns develop before they happen so that you can go oh this person's about to leave this relationship because they feel rejected even though i haven't rejected them i've loved them but they don't know how to receive love yet. So I'm just gonna keep loving them until they're at a point where they can receive this, okay? So that's the most important thing. And then identify your fears. What are you afraid of? For men, this can be very difficult because most of us men, we're not trained, we're not taught to ever even think about fear. We go through life and we actually just kind of turn it off where it's like, I'm not afraid of anything. You know, I'm, I'm a man, right? And until you have kids, and then as a man, you're like, oh, I'd be afraid if this happened to my kid, or I'd be afraid if this happened to my wife, or I'd be afraid of this happening to my um, business. So sometimes these are things that have to be processed. And so the keys in this is getting to the core belief system. Let me give you an example. 
um, belief systems or what I would call a life commandment can be the difference between life and death. Um, so I'm in America and I look both ways before I cross the street. Mom and dad always taught me, look both ways before you cross the street. Well, when I cross the street, you know, I look and I look, right? But when I go to a country that drives on the other side of the road, that life camp commandment that has kept me safe all these years could actually kill me. So I'm in London, England. I'm touring with my rugby team and I'm just about to step out on the curve because just like in America, I've looked, I've looked the way I would in America. As I go to step out on the curve, one of my rugby teammates grabs me in the back of the shirt and yanks me out of the street. I was just about to step in. And as I did, the mirror on a bus just went, whoom. that bus would have killed me. That life commandment, that belief system that I had, look both ways before you cross the street. It was very helpful in one moment of my life, but in that moment, it was not helpful. Okay. And oftentimes we can't even identify our belief system. So this is why I say, look at behavior. If you're married and your spouse is hitting you, right? You go, wow, that is not a very helpful thing, right? If your spouse is hitting you, that's like the behavior of a four, five, six year old, right? Who cannot communicate. You know, if your spouse is always blowing up in anger, again, that's a person that has been traumatized. They have not learned how to communicate effectively. They've not learned the difference between, you know, in conflict resolution, it's not attack the person, it's let's attack the problem. Let's have a conversation. Let's have an agreement upon what is it we're actually dealing with and let's attack the problem together as a team versus attacking each other and sadly that's what most of us do so you go to deal with you know the emotions you go to deal with the belief systems and the triggers and you begin to look at these and you kind of map them out and kind of look at what is the things that are setting me off if i'm always getting explosively angry or if i'm always feeling sad what are the things leading up to those behaviors that are causing you to feel stuck and and depressed and sad that's really really important and it takes a process and many times someone else looking at you listening to you they can hear as you talk and they can begin to go oh you just said this this happens so many times where i would say to someone well, you just said this and they go, oh, I don't believe that at all. And I'm like, well, you, but you just said it. So there must be some kind of belief. And then you would look at their behavior and it actually lined up with what they were saying, even though they're like, oh, I don't believe that at all. So it's very important and very key to listen to what people are actually saying, watch what they do. And then, you know, for yourself and for others, help them process emotions. Now, here's a great example. As a parent with your kids, let's say, you know, your kid, five, six, seven, eight, you know, Johnny, right? Johnny's got a toy and his sister just takes the toy away from him. And what does Johnny do? He just whacks his sister, right? Well, we know that's not appropriate. We have to have the conversation with our kid. And so as a counselor, as a pastor, as a life coach, as a sozo leader, whatever it is you're doing, whatever kind of ministry, it's really important to, to pull Johnny aside and start to help Johnny process. All right, Johnny, obviously you're very, very angry right now. You feel disrespected. You don't feel loved because your sister stole your toy away from you. And you begin to use the words that would help Johnny begin to process intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually what's going on. Because if you ask Johnny, hey, why did you do that? Because she took my toy, right? They would have some kind of reaction like that. And then what you do is, you know, you as you help Johnny de-escalate, you're actually teaching them these are the words, and this works with adults as well because you look at an adult that's hitting people at 30, 40, 50 years old or screaming at people and emotionally abusing them. It all goes back to the beginning. So as Johnny learns these skills, then you can go, okay, Johnny, now you need to go apologize to your sister, right? So he does. He apologizes. Of course, they love each other. And then you have to pull his sister aside and say, hey, so explain to me why you felt like you needed to take the toy. And again, it's just a, another time to process. Now, sadly, most parents won't do this because they're like, oh, they'll just figure it out. And unless you and your spouse are the most healthy people on earth, um, kids don't just figure this out on their own. They will pick up and do whatever you're doing. Monkey see, monkey do, and they'll copy you. And then they will marry a spouse who has a mixture of your good and a mixture of your bad. So let's just deal with it now while they're young so that they can grow and be just amazing like children of God and grow up into amazing adults. Make sense? Okay, so let's just review. Um, 
identify, is this a spiritual issue? Is this emotional issue? And then how do you connect them together? Okay. Because let's say you get delivered from the demon of depression, but your body is still physically manifesting that. Sometimes you have to give your body a chance to get reconnected in a sense, because oftentimes if you're someone who deals with chronic pain, what happens is you just disconnect from it. And so at first it was like a nine or an eight on the scheme, on the pain scale, but then eventually you've cut yourself off so much from that pain that you don't think about it as much. Now it feels like a three or four because you're not connected to your, your physical body anymore in a sense. And so if you thought of yourself as a soul and a spirit walking around and your body's kind of over here, we have to put it all together, okay? So deal with the familiar spirits, deal with the emotional issues, seek help, and believe me, help is great. I've heard ministers say, oh, I only need the Holy Spirit. Well, that's great. If the Holy Spirit's going to heal you and do a miracle in your life, then fantastic. But we just can't, we just can't lie um, because if a relationship hurt you, a relationship is going to heal you. So if you've, if you've ever believed the lie that the Holy Spirit's going to heal you from everything and, you know, that is possible, but it's very rare because God uses people for us to learn how to receive love so that we can then give it to other people over and over again. But let me tell you a story about a miracle. So I met this woman uh, and she had, let me just tell you her story. So when she was in high school, she, um, her and her sister were driving drunk and she got in a horrible crash and sadly she killed her sister. Um, and so for most of her life, she never told anyone. She'd only told her husband and one other person and the family didn't even really know what the circumstances were. Um, and because she didn't tell people she was drunk or any of that kind of stuff. So as she grew older, like she, she started a relationship with Jesus maybe five years after that. But the whole time she would have these familiar spirits that would tell her, you know what, you're not worthy. You're not saved. You killed your sister. And she would battle these thoughts her whole life. And she was so embarrassed she wouldn't tell anyone, not knowing if she was sitting in front of me, I'd just be like, yeah, that's normal. That's what happens in some of these situations when those traumatic spiritual, emotional doors open up. She thought she was going to be rejected if she shared these kinds of things with somebody. So, so mind you, I meet her in her seventies and she's been struggling all these years. And so I'm asking her all these questions and I'm ministering to her. And I ask her like, did you ever go for deliverance? Did you ever do a Sozo? Did you ever? And she's like, yeah, I did deliverance. She named the person's names. I knew fa fairly well-known person in my area. And I'm like, well, why couldn't they help you? And she's like, well, I never really told them what happened. And I was like, well, why not? And that's when she said, I, you know, I was afraid I was going to get rejected, judged, all those kind of things. But um, what was really fascinating is I'm thinking, well, why are you telling me? Well, she was ready to deal with her issues. She was done um, being stuck anymore. And she just wanted out of it. Right. And I asked her, I said, well, at any point in your life, did you think that this would get you know, be dealt with. And she's like, yeah, I went to a Sozo appointment and I told God if they bring it up, then I'll talk about it. And most of us know Sozo doesn't work that way, but that was her big thing. Like if they discern it and if they bring it up, then I'll talk about it because she was like, that's my test. God, I want to know that, um, that you're real, that you love me. And then they didn't bring it up, even though they might've already, they might've known it. They might've been able to see it in the spirit. And so she just kept living her life. Now, what ended up happening is she never drank a drop of alcohol in her life. Her husband never drank a drop of alcohol in her life. But what happened is those familiar spirits then jumped her generation and her kids all had battles with alcohol. So here I am meeting her at 70 years old and I'll just cut to the chase. So we're in a small group and I often do this. We go into heaven and uh, I just have them reach out to Jesus. And as she's reaching out to Jesus, she sees her sister in heaven and her and her sister begins to speak to her and, and tell her how much she loves her, how amazing heaven is and how she forgives her. And all I'm seeing is I know I can feel the presence of God and I can see that she's having an encounter and she is just weeping uncontrollably. And God is absolutely healing her because experiences through relationships heal so she, after she comes out of this encounter, she begins to tell us what happened and all the other people I knew about her past, but none of the other people knew about her past. So she begins to tell us everything her sister said and what happened. The change was so dramatic.
that her physiological, her body changed, her emotions changed, and she even walked different because of the healing she received. So it's key to understand that, yes, Jesus can heal emotional issues instantaneously, um, and we should go after that. But we also need to understand, like, there is a process that most people have to go through um, to receive these kind of healings. Now, I just want to do an activation with you. Um, and as I kind of close out this, um, this video, um, I, what I want you to do is when I get towards the end, I want you just to um, just allow, allow yourself to stay in the presence of God. But this is one of the number one things I do, whether I'm working with five people or a thousand people. And where I've seen the Holy Spirit move powerfully, where people are weeping, they're on, their f on the floor just crying, and where the Holy Spirit and the angels are actually touching people and giving them deep, deep, deep emotional healing of things that people have never told anyone. And so that's what I'm going to believe for as we go do this. So what I want you to do, uh, if you feel comfortable, just go ahead and close your eyes, and we're just going to go into heaven. The Bible says that Jesus tore the veil between heaven and earth, that we have full access to heaven. So I just want you to Take a breath, reach out your hand, and allow Jesus to take you into heaven. Now, whether you see, feel, or understand anything that's going on, remember, faith is taking an action. We're going to trust that God is going to do something through this process. Even if we don't understand it or even if we don't think something's happening, we're going to trust by because of faith, by us taking this action, that the Holy Spirit's going to move. So as Jesus takes your hand, I want you just to allow Jesus to take you into the river of God. And I want you just to stand in the river and I want you to feel the river begin to, to go up to your knees. And as it goes up to your knees, I want you just to turn so the river is flowing away from you. So the river is actually like hitting your back. And as it's hitting your back, I want you, because this is heaven, you can swim underwater. You can breathe underwater. There's no limitations. I want you to begin to feel the river flowing through your whole body. And as the river is coming up over your shoulders and over your head, I want you to begin to see whether it's anxiety, depression, whatever it is you're struggling with, I want you to begin to see it leave. And as you see those black spots just leave you and flow down the river, I want you just to begin to thank Jesus for that. And you can keep holding on to his hand or not. It's up to you. So Holy Spirit, we thank you for touching every single person watching this video. We thank you for bringing complete and total emotional and spiritual healing. And we thank you for healing physical bodies. We command every, every person's body that's watching this to come under alignment with heaven, that the blood of Jesus would just begin to just to touch every single person as the blood and the water begin to just mingle and, and heal every single person watching. We thank you for just supernatural restoration through you, God. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your work. So I want you just to see whatever it is that's been bothering you begin to leave you whether it's a bad mindset, whether it's a negative emotions, whether it's a bad trauma, begin to just see it leave you and flow down the river. And don't forget to take a big, deep breath. And just engage with God and just thank God for what he's doing. And I want you to continue, even though I'm going to, to end the video, I want you just to continue to stay in the presence of God. You can do this for 5, 10, 15 minutes. You can do this with your children. Um, you can just teach them how to engage with the presence of God this way. Um, if they're afraid of the dark, whatever it is, you can teach them to go to Jesus in this place. So, so we just thank you, Holy Spirit. So just continue to engage with the presence of God um, even after the video is over. God bless you. Shaka.